I find it hard to drift off to sleep, he murmured softly. I gave a small roll of my eyes, aware of his usual antics when desiring something. What's on your mind? I inquired, getting straight to the point. Mal cleared his throat, his usual prelude to asking a favor. Sleep eludes me tonight, he confessed, settling opposite me at our compact kitchen table. Perhaps some company would help. I, unlike him, seldom retired early. Dear Mal, always retiring at dusk. All right, I'll join you after mighty, I responded, savoring my nightly honeydew ritual. Tomorrow, I must run errands. I remember, toilet paper is on the list, Mal noted, rhythmically tapping his fingers on the table, waiting patiently as I sipped mighty. His gaze seemed to carry a silent predique of my not always aligning with his plans. Did you agree to work tomorrow night? I questioned, disliking the necessity of such inquiries, taking another sip of mighty. Feeling its warmth and sweetness, I awaited his answer. No, I suggested Johnny for it. He's in need of the pash, Mal casually said, prompting me to speak up, albeit reluctantly. We could have used that extra money. Why do you pass up these opportunities? Listen, he began, visibly hesitant. By I, yes, I urged. Finishing mighty, I'm heading to bed. Rising, frustration welled within me. I longed to instill some sense in him. Though my deep affection for him would never allow it, I'm tired of spending all my time at that shop. Mal burst out, his exasperation apparent. And I'm tired of my job too, I counted. Realizing the irony in my words, since I hadn't been at work for two days. After placing my mug in the sink, I washed my hands, relishing the water's flow. In death, they's just endless void. As if our existence never mattered, Mal's anger surged. A pitiable yet irritating display. His philosophical rants were common during these moments of existential crisis. Begging him to stop was pointless. It only aggravated him more. So, I sighed and planted a kiss on his cheek. He sat there, momentarily speechless, his urge to continue his rant quelled. Entering the bedroom first, a custom of ours, I grabbed my beloved, worn pajamas. These were a gift from six years ago, a relic from my life before moving away, a period I try to forget due to its associated sorrow. Facing the mirror, I began undressing, confronting my own imperfections that we all pretend don't exist, the stretch marks and cellulite familiar to both women and men, were a testament to my physical history. Mal's non-judgmental nature, one of his endearing qualities, always shone through. He chose self-scrutiny over judging others, sometimes excessively so. I closed my eyes, reminiscing about a beach day with my ex fiance overshadowed by a looming storm and a captivating yet treacherous ocean, Mal entered and quickly hid under the covers. This prompted me to ponder if he truly appreciated my body or was indifferent to romance. When are your parents visiting this weekend? I asked while undressing, wondering if he truly noticed me. His response was muffled from beneath the comforter. I can't hear you, I said. He reappeared, saying, Saturday at one. Considering our meal plans, I asked, What about dinner? Shrimp tacos. Let's order them, he suggested. Order them, I echoed. Yes. 
and with that, he vanished again under the covers. In our tiny bathroom, the signs of wear and age were evident. The old heater, the balcony with our rusty grill, a gift from Mal's brother Darren, all spoke of the passage of time. I examined my face in the mirror, noting its flaws and the imperfections of the mirror itself. Opening the medicine cabinet, I gathered my toothbrush, acne cream, toothpaste, and deodorant. Medway through my furrow toothbrushing, I felt Mal's presence. He appeared, wearing an expression of sorrow and confusion. Is everything all right? I asked after spitting out the toothpaste. I regret my earlier behavior, he confessed, pulling me into his typical embrace of apology. I cherished him deeply. It's fine, I reassured him, my mind wandering to a happier memory of it with Mel, far more pleasant than the beach memory. In bed, his breathing was heavier than usual. We lay there, his gaze fixed on the ceiling, mine on him. Mel, I whispered, he looked at me. I'd like a doc, what kind? he asked. Another Italian greyhound. I noticed sadness and confusion in his eyes again. Are you okay? I asked, my hand on his cheek. Tat to me. I want more. Something my mother and I desire, he yawned, downplaying his emotions. I'm thirty. Mom's nearly sixty. Dad's impatient and... I disliked these discussions where he intertwined his dreams with mine. I gazed upwards, pondering. We'd need at least a year to afford a child. We need a bitter place. We need a child before I lose it, Karen, he said, his longing evident. He's wanted a child since he was young. His intensity matched my desire to avoid this topic. But I let him vent. Chooses, Karen Ann. I just want a family with you. You'd be a great mother, he exasperatedly said. Christ, relax, Mel. We'll have a family eventually. I soothed him. He hugged me, his breathing slowing. My eyes grew heavy. Memories of happier times playing in my mind. Soon, I drifted off dreaming of a beach. A tap on my shoulder startled me, and I faced a blonde man offering company. I'm Mel. Hi, I'm Karen Ann. He sat down. The warm mare was a reminder of the sin's relentless sign. Karen Ann, Mel's voice, now in reality, pulled me back. Do you love me? Of course, I replied feeling his breath on my shoulder. Why ask? Sometimes I worry. You know, I've been questioning life lately. He turned, looking up. Is living in a fantasy bad? I hesitated. Sometimes. Can I live in one? If you want, he murmured, his voice trailing off into the night. I closed my eyes, envisioning a future with children and a spacious home, an unspoken dream, 